welcome to worship this morning. It is a pleasure to be back with you after all these many months. And to, uh, once again, we're always glad to come to Walter. My wife and I always look forward to that. See, we don't think uh, Pastor Gothy takes enough time off. That's a good thing. Welcome to worship. May the Lord be with us as we worship. Let us sing with great joy. Remembering God's great gifts to us in holy baptism, we begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, poor and miserable sinner, sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for you. And sincerely repent of them. And I pray, Lord, your boundless mercy, 
and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings of death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful here. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts away for sorrow. Put false ways far from me. And graciously teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. My set your just decrees before me. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I will run in the way of your commandments. When you enlarge my heart, glory be to God and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it Make me understand the way of your precepts. And I will meditate on your wondrous works. O oh, merciful Lord, you did not spare your only Son, but delivered him up for us all. Grant us courage and strength to take up the cross and follow him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. 
Please be seated to hear the reading of God's Word. Our Old Testament reading for the 14th Sunday after Pentecost is found written in Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and just decrees, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not long live long in the land you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life, that you and your offspring may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Fear the Lord, you hit saints. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. Our epistle reading is found written in Philemon. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Appia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent, in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own free will. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand, I will repay it, to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please rise in honor of the Holy Gospel. Hallelujah. Far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 14th chapter. Now great crowds accompanied Jesus, and he turned and said to them, 
If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able to, with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pot. It's thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the gospel of the Lord. Having heard the word of God, let us confess our common faith together as is stated in the ancient Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father of all. Please be seated for our hymn of the day.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. In the small catechism, the third article of the Creed, Martin Luther wrote, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified, and kept me in the true faith. So that's it then. God did it all. I'm home free. It's smooth sailing the rest of my days. And that renders the Old Testament reading and the gospel reading today completely irrelevant for me. I'm already chosen and I'm a disciple. Not so fast. That thinking teeters on the brink of the deadly precipice of cheap grace. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, living and preaching in Hitler's shadow, wrote, Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is a grace without discipleship, grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. Our readings today tell us that simply cannot be. Luke 14 and Deuteronomy 30 tell us that grace cannot be cheap. It's impossible. It's like salt not being salty or life and death, blessing and curse being indistinguishable. Salt is salty. It's one of the most stable compounds on all the earth. It has to be salty. And we can sure tell the other things apart. Alive and dead are pretty much obvious to us. The Old Testament reading is about choices, and the Gospel reading tells us that those choices are personal and difficult. And both texts indicate consequences of choices that have hard, fast boundaries in the strongest possible terms. Cheap grace seeks to hide the cost of discipleship from people. It seeks to claim that as long as we make a profession of faith, we're saved. God's grace does cover all of our sins, and that's a wonderful truth. The Apostle Paul writes, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5, 20 and 21. Yet right after that, he follows with, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in? Romans 6, 1 and 2. Salvation by grace alone through faith alone is so much more than simply mouthing the words, Jesus is Lord. We're not saved by a mere profession of faith, but by a living and active faith, according to James chapter 2. A real faith that manifests itself in repentance, obedience, love of God and neighbor. Salvation is not a mere transaction, it's a transformation. And Paul says it best when he says we are new creations in Christ in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing cheap about grace. The religion of Christianity, the, the discipleship of following Christ, is also a dissident identity. It will interfere with your life. Stephen, Paul, or Peter would testify to that. And all of the martyrs would tell us that marching to death cheerfully will most definitely interfere with the neat pattern of your life in a big way. If you look at Luke 14, 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That phrase is reiterated three times by Jesus himself. It's about our cross. Someone carrying a cross no longer controls their own destiny. Control is relinquished when that cross is picked up. It becomes an all-absorbing interest. Crucifixion was against the will of every single person who experienced it, except for Jesus Christ. And our identifying with his Christ is volitional. The does not is pretty much will not. You see, our personal cross can be rejected. 
other interferences in our life cannot. Law, hunger, accidents, natural disasters, illness, death, all intrude upon our lives and we are helpless to resist. But our personal cross, we are allowed to resist. It is to our eternal peril, but it is allowed. By its very definition, regeneration requires a separation from the world. The world is the Bible name for human society. A Christian becomes a possession of Jesus, a citizen of his kingdom, a servant to his will and his purposes. His spirit animates us to be nonconformists to the status quo of fallen human nature and idolatry in all of its ancient and its modern forms. In Luke 14, Jesus stunned the crowds following him, and perhaps with us with it, his description of the cost of discipleship. He put a very high price on it. Hate your own? There is hardly a statement in the entire Bible more shocking and perplexing than Luke 14, 26. Hatred seems to be utterly paradoxical to the nature and the teaching of Christ. Jesus said on at least four occasions to love your neighbor as yourself. If neighbors have to be loved, then surely one's family has to be loved, no matter how hard that can be at times. Hatred is altogether forbidden. 1 John 4, 20. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. John also says that the one who hates his brother is a murderer. How can we possibly reconcile such statements with the demand of our Lord to hate our family. The language is shocking. Jesus excoriated the Pharisees for their failure to honor their father and mother. Jesus even said we had to love our enemies. So what is up with the hate? Hating here is a Semitic expression for loving less than. Jesus is not telling us to hate our relatives. That would violate the fifth commandment. But he meant that those who follow him must love him with a deeper love than their dearest and nearest, and even their own lives. Hate here is a word of contrast, emphasizing position, not feelings. And this is the true division of the cross. Discipleship is fundamentally a call to allegiance and loyalty. Jesus is to have first place over all. Hate here is not a literal malice towards oneself, but rather it indicates the most sublime expression of selflessness that is expressed hyperbolically as hatred. Love and hate are not opposites. Love and hate are both strong emotions. Apathy is the opposite of both love and hate. And that's a far cry from the cheap grace Christianity in modern America. That tends to be easy and upbeat and convenient and inexpensive. It doesn't require self-sacrifice, discipline, humility, an eternal outlook or a fear as well as a love to God. There's little guilt and no punishment. The payoff in heaven is virtually certain. The vast majority of what passes for Christianity might best be labeled consumer Christianity. Low cost, high customer satisfaction, and perhaps satisfaction even guaranteed. But the truth is, Christ died on a cross for our sins, not for our satisfaction. And he calls us to trust in him, then follow him with a life of self-denial. In a world where the customer's always right, it takes the historic faith, the radical obedience to God and the purity of word and sacrament to keep from buying into this consumer Christianity. Martin Luther's 95 theses that got tapped on the door and started it all. Number one, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. And number three says, yet it does not mean solely inner repentance. Such inner repentance is worthless unless it produces various outward mortifications of the flesh. Today's texts and history teach us that grace definitely not cheap. And then at the end it says, whoever has ears, let him hear. According to the gospel reading and the Old Testament reading, this cross-bearing and this choosing to do so is serious business. It has eternal consequences as our decisions determine 
destiny. From the Latin word, destinare. Make firm. Establish. In Deuteronomy 30, 15, today, that's the hope of a new beginning. You see, in every age, there are moments when it is again today. A moment in which God breaks into time. And people, individually and collectively, are offered life and prosperity, death and adversity. The first century Christian, the Hebrew writer in chapters 3 and 4, writes, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Wherever God's word of law and gospel is heard or read, it is again today. It's God's moment for us in which each of us must decide how we will respond to that word. Jesus states his call and his demand in terms just as uncompromising as Moses did, and those who would follow him must carefully consider the cost of discipleship. Today's gospel reading leaves no doubt that disciples must make a sharp break with their past. They must make a commitment and do as the Lord commands. Grace is free, but it's certainly not cheap. The truth of the cross being carried is actually precious and is quite profound. The infinite and omniscient God can and has revealed the mysteries of his saving purposes to a lowly, undeserving, often hard-hearted and unresponsive people. The truth presented in the gospel by the Spirit is not obscure or elusive. Our opportunities and responsibilities are transparent and personal. There must be a personal response to the offer of grace. Using a figure of speech, a metonymy, where the effect stands for the cause, Moses presented the options of life and good or death and disaster. That is, he extended choices which, when made, they'll result in one pair or the other. The choices are either to love the Lord or to reject him. For example, life and prosperity, by way of metonymy, represent blessing in its most significant forms, quality and quantity of life. I want to share with you ever so briefly seven factors about this choosing to carry our personal cross. You are free to choose to carry your personal cross or don't. You are not free not to choose. Not to choose is to choose. It is to choose evil. You are not free to choose the consequences of your choices. You are free to jump or to not jump from a 10-story motel room window. If you jump, consequences will happen, and you cannot choose what those consequences are. You are free to choose, but you are not free to achieve. At 66 years old, 250 pounds in arthritic, I could choose to be a ballerina probably will not be successful in achieving that. One big choice can take care of a lot of little choices. If you choose, fellows, to be loyal to your wife in marriage, it will eliminate the small choices of whether or not to flirt, view pornography, choose a prostitute, try to find a cheap divorce attorney, or where to park your car while you live in it. God's already chosen you in the cross that you might choose him. That's why we call the elect. We love him because he first loved us. Thank God every day for his sovereignty and his call to you that you have heard the gospel. The day of choice is an open door, and as we heard in the scriptures recently, it's an open door that will be shut. Don't think you have forever to make up your mind whether you're going to take up your cross or not. Time of life and duration of days is chosen solely by God. We must choose wisely. And I admonish you to pick up your cross. Now may the peace of our God keep your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ in the one true faith forevermore until our faith is made final. Amen. It's time for we rise to sing the offertory.
Please rise for prayer. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O God, our King, you counted the terrible cost of our salvation and sent your Son to give his life on the cross. Inspire our hearts to trust fully in his sacrificial victory that we would follow in his way through death and into eternal life. Help us value your grace like the treasure that it is. Lord, in your mercy. Divine Shepherd, you give life to your church through your holy word. Grant your people always to walk in your way and receive your blessings as they serve you in this world and in the life to come. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you are our life and length of day. You set before us your gift of life and your holy word. Preserve your institutions of marriage and family. Guard husbands, wives, parents, and children, both from despising and from idolizing one another. Instead, let every relationship in the home exemplify your love for us in Christ and grant that all might follow him in their service to one another. Lord, in your mercy. Good Lord, preserve us from the ways of the wicked and prosper us in your paths. For our land and its leaders and those in authority, we pray that they would come to repentance and submit to your will, that you, our gracious God, might grant us to live peaceful and quiet lives. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, grant to us joy in the calling you have given to each of us, that we might render service to you in our works of love toward our neighbors. Remember those in need of honest labor and daily bread. Give them gainful employment according to your good and gracious will. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, give the strength of the Spirit to all who are suffering or in any kind of need, and especially to those we have been asked to remember. For the comfort of Craig, Christina, Shirley, Timothy, Sue, and the family of Michael. For the mercy of healing for James, Kim, Ron, Keith, Cor, Dan, Cliff, Jim, Ruby, Kathy, Roger, and Randy, that they may all have courage and will to take up their crosses and follow the Savior through suffering and into the joys of everlasting life. For the comfort of our shut-ins, Pat, Ruth, and all, and for the grace and peace of Spring family as they mourn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have set before us life and death, blessing and curse in your holy word. Now at the altar, through his own word, your Son sets before us his own body and blood. Grant that all who receive the sacrament today might do so with prepared and penitent hearts, and bear the cross rejoicing in your gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation for the sake of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Preserve us, O Lord, from all temptations and grant us faith, that we may rest all our prayers and the desires of our hearts in your merciful arms, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with my spirit. Lift up your heart. And up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and say,
remember us in your kingdom and hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please rise to sing. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. We implore you that under your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn.
Have a couple of brief announcements this morning. The funeral for Jackie Spring will be at the end of September in her former town of Dublin, which is Columbus, Ohio. Uh, future info will be made available as it comes from the family, and that will be in the church bulletin. There is a new confessional study group meeting every Wednesday, 7 p.m. Join us as we walk through the Book of Concord. A little commercial, I highly recommend it. This is a great study, and it's a wonderful opportunity to answer pastor questions that will make him squirm. <laughs> There's a lot of great stuff in there. Uh, sign up sheet for the women's retreat on October 1st is uh, outside there. And we are celebrating birthdays today, so we can have fellowship after the meeting uh, when that is over. One final announcement. Thank you so much for letting Peggy and I come and me serve you in word and sacrament. It's just been a delight. As always, we just expect to have a wonderful time when we come to Walmart. Thanks again. Missa Finita Edge, deceived in Pache, Mass is ended. Depart in peace. <laughs> <laughs>